useful to, I don't know, what do, what do you say? Do you say useful to the movement, to the movement? Do we say, is it useful to, um, to, I don't know. I, I, I mostly wanted to open it up as a discussion about what the lay person or what the person who isn't likely to get a job with SpaceX going to do to make this more likely to happen for a greater number of people. So that's what I was thinking. And when I, you say make it happen for a greater number of people, yeah, what does that mean to you? To me it means seeing space as a as a part of our environment and as a part, as a place where community happens, a place where that is viewed as um, as viewed as a norm. It's it's right now we we look at space as being a place. What well, general population tends to look at space as being a place where special people get to visit, um, and. I would much rather it become more of a place that we consider to be part of our environment, yet another place where people go to do work, to be entertained, to explore, um, to, to make what's out there become far more in contact with individuals on a, on a regular basis. Um, you know, a lot of us love the idea of going into space, but there's like the the fierce realization that I'm not going to be an astronaut. You know, okay, I'm not going to be an astronaut. Why does that mean I can't go to space? You know, if, if, and for everybody it's different. You might be somebody who would be happy to go on a ship because you, just for the entertainment value. And I think that a lot of people are like that. They just want to feel what it's like to be weightless. They want to see what it's like to view the Earth from up above. A lot of a lot more people, I think, who are here are like that would be great, and I'd not say no to that. But I'd also like to, you know, put my two cents in towards seeing us visit other planets, maybe colonize or have a settlement, or at least visit and see what things are. You know, feel the the dirt with our hands, or if something I'm doing is makes it more likely that Jesse gets to go and feel the dirt with his hands. You know, um, but I'm not going to build a rocket. I'm not going to. Um, I'm not going to do the programming that makes the rocket work. Um, I could be somebody who's really good at fundraising. You know, I could be somebody who, and that's kind of where the where do these ideas come up? You know, what can I be doing that means that exploration of space and using space as a resource and using space as a potential place for living. Um, becomes more of a norm and less of an extraordinary idea. It becomes more of something that is regularly conceived of as a possible, or as why are we not doing that, rather than why are we bothering to do that. So I was hoping to brainstorm ideas for what people who are in my position, or similar, people who are not likely to become astronauts anytime soon, in the sense that I'm not likely to join NASA's astronaut training program, for example, um, either could potentially become, I know there was a discussion this morning about how do people get into space? You know, you were there, Jesse, right? The, and I missed part of that because I was hanging with them. But, um, and that was part of it. You know, there are, there are ways to get into space. You have to find them. But how do I, person with my two feet on the ground who you know, is not likely to build rockets or become an astronaut through conventional means. Help the movement to make that more possible for a greater number of people. Does that kind of answer? Mm -hmm. So that's kind of where I'm coming from. Well, the nice thing about expanding the space frontier and, and, and building a, a, a society that lives and works in space is that you're going to have to have all kinds of careers. Mm -hmm. So you're going to have to have cooks and chefs. You're going to have to have people grow food, you're going to have to have people that repair spacesuits, you know, in space, you're going to have to have all the, all those industries and things that we have here are just mm -hmm. in space, in the context of space. Right. So that's, that is very much true, and while that right now might sound like kind of a niche market, um, because I might 
decide I'm going to become a, a, a oh, cook oh, who's okay. really good at cooking in space. So I understand how to prepare food under a number of different types of gravity. I know how to make food and adjust the spicing for alterations in how people experience taste, right? That might, you know, I, I will understand the chemistry such that if I'm cooking on Mars, perhaps the um, there's something about cooking on Mars that affects the chemistry of my cooking, or I have to understand high altitude versus low altitude mm -hmm. in a different way. That would be something I would want to do. Um, and those are all things that I would like to see become necessary. And so the, I guess, what I'm wondering is, when I leave here, is there something I can start doing that helps, other than just talking to other people I know as I interact with them? You know what and I mean? The first question is, what do you do for a living? I'm a stay-at-home mom. Yay! So who do you, I'm a home who, educator. Do you, who do you hang out with? I hang out with other home educators. I hang out with other parents who have oh, chosen home to. educators. Yeah, which so is a schoolers. definable, I mean, that's a definable, that's a, it there, is a, definable there's a curriculum yeah. that you have to, the, you have to adhere to on some level, right? Right, right. on some level, yes. So, sure. so could you could you could you take steps to get added to that core curriculum? Some kind of you know awareness of of you know future career. Th I'm trying to find a way to right. say it so so it's not just your advocacy for this thing that you're into. Right. But, but you know, in other words, I assume one of the reasons to homeschool is to have sort of a more the world is your is your more school. independent right. kind of a of a ability to shape your education the it way is. you want to shape it, right? It is. Um, so I would think that's a huge opportunity. Right. You know, and so that would be a, that would be something that I can do and have thought about doing a lot over the course of this weekend. It's come up a lot. So in fact, that was the thing I was going to talk to you about: the idea of um, creating. Um, we talked a little bit about having classes as part of a, mm -hmm. a space curriculum. You know, if right. people wanted to have a curriculum that they followed, would it be possible to do that through the Emporium kind of thing? I'm wondering, the, whoever s supplies you with the materials for your homeschooling, can you influence them to put more questions about things done on the moon than, uh, you know, instead of a farmer plowing a field, it's so big by so big, right. and yet uh, a moon miner stripping a field that's so big by so big, you know, right. just the, the thought association that here's some guy working on the moon. Right, exactly, yeah. creating it, letting it can, become a norm rather than get that story. into the books. Right, yeah, with, um, with what I'm doing, it's a little less, um, it's a little more difficult in that um, California doesn't actually require a specific curriculum. So we do a lot, we, it, it, there's a, it's a very independent process and each family does its own curriculum and they don't even, you don't have to meet certain requirements. So um, you, um, you can either work with charter schools that have curriculums that you can use or you can not. But, um, but in terms of that, in terms of finding ways to create, um, to let s space and references to being in space and the possibility of being in space and l thinking about it becomes a, a part of your normal conversation with your children or whatever. So that that is one way to do it. And that, that is kind of the direction I go in. Um, Joy, I was curious about um, how you, I think you've thought about this a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yes. just a little bit. Actually, it started at Space Up San Diego. We had a brilliant idea and a really good session about using fiction, because that's what I do. I'm a writer. Mm -hmm. And on my boldest of days, I occasionally dare to dream about being the next Ray Bradbury. That's never going to happen, but well, <laughs> I, I'm allowed, allowed to dream about it. Because right, so. that's how I fell in love with Mars, is Martian Chronicles, which I read in freshman year of college. And it just changed everything. Right. Um, and, this, and I started thinking about why did that change how I thought about it, and I realized it's because Bradbury made Mars feel like home. And it, it was that that changed me through looking at, oh, this is what we're doing up there, this is how we could get there. But it relied on the emotion changing first. And so I started a blog, it's supposed to be collaborative, but most of my collaborators dropped out. Because <laughs> everybody's schedules are crazy, it, it happens. Um, but writing from the point of view of the first colonists on Mars, and focusing more on the human element, and adding the science when I have it, but honestly, I'm not that great with science. So, it, 
I know enough to do some popular level stuff, but that's about it. And just making, again, making Mars feel like home. Right. And using it through fiction because it's easier for people to read, it's easier for people to understand and connect with. So I think I have maybe four readers right now. But the people that are reading it said, oh yeah, I never actually thought about this in terms of these particular emotions before. Oh, so, well, that's a start. Sure. Um, yeah, I'd like to see more of that kind of stuff. Um, you know, more science fiction movies about other places as where people just living in other places and in space and just make that a little more normal would be great. Not so much the, oh, the big asteroid's gonna come and destroy us or oh, we met this civilization. Like, those are fun, but mm -hmm. not ultimately that helpful and to have very human stories simply set in other places. Mm -hmm. yeah. Making it a an understood part of what you're doing or what you're talking about. If I am um, in a set of circumstances that other people might consider to be unusual, but I'm talking about it as though it is the normal thing, and it is my normal thing, um, the more I do so, the more barriers get broken down to the idea that that is unusual and we don't, need, we're not going to, you know, nobody's ever going to do that. Unreachable. Yeah. Unreachable. Well, and, you know, so for so much of human history, and even now, we communicate everything by story, mm -hmm. or at least by narrative. Right. You don't want to use words in the story. And so, you know, in my opinion, a lot that's why a lot of things went south after the moon missions because we didn't have any narrative that took us beyond the moon. Mm -hmm. It was just we have to beat the Russians. Okay, we did that, and then everyone says, okay, well we did that. There wasn't any story to take the anyone end. any further. <laughs> the end. Right. Yeah. And, and right. we were so we just haven't had that many stories about the actual thing, either things that actually happened or the things that could happen. You know, we have Apollo thirteen, which is great. People love the movie. That's fantastic. Um, but why isn't there a film version of the book Roving Mars? It would be fantastic, and it would show what people actually do, and it doesn't exist because people aren't used to thinking of it in terms of story. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, some of the people on the science side don't like having it presented as story, because sure, inaccuracy, inaccuracies creep in, but I think you're gonna have to have some of that just to get people interested at all. Yeah. You know, I, I read a lot of science fiction and I watch a lot of science fiction, but it, it's in, in some sense we are not creating a, a realistic future for ourselves as far as in fiction. And you've got Star Trek, which is way out there. Way out there. But, and, but you've got, you know, you got, there are some things that are happening, but you're not really, I mean, and I think this is where science fiction has a, a role, and it's sort of developing these these future possibilities that we can then kind of grow towards. Mm -hmm. I mean, like, cause, you know, uh, uh, in some sense, Star Trek focused a lot of people to, to help, you know, drive a, 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 the Apollo era, mm -hmm. in a way. Um, but, you know, there, there are, it just seems like there's, you've got the creature features, you've got, you know, the, the really far out science, uh, far ahead science fiction and stuff, time travel, whatever. It is. But there's nothing that's sort of, out there, but reachable, kind of, right. like, the, where you can... You know, the next step. Everything's yeah. about out of sight of our solar system, and there's nothing yeah. about the guy who's setting up a shop in, on Mars someplace. Right. Yeah, right. mining Titan for men. Right. You know, yeah. that, that and I think there's room for that, because, you know, one of my favorite sci-fi things ever is Firefly, and that was at least a vision of other worlds as frontiers that people could right. live on. And right. people love that, that mix of Old West and new stuff. So there's at least a space for it, yeah. I think. Mean, I, I think there's a good space for it. Oh, I do. You know, I, that, that's why I feel unsatisfied with love science fiction is because it's 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 way far out there and it's not where I can see humanity going. Going right, right. right. So I guess what I'm wondering is when I leave here, and we talked a little bit about this earlier too. But when I leave here and I go home, okay, Joy, you can write on your you can write more stories that help people to envision you know, a future in which this is a normal part of where we are. Um, and that's one thing that could be done. Um, what else can be done when I leave here? If I'm not going to go to my office tomorrow and start working on a rocket, what else, you know, what can I be doing? And so we talked about I can be influencing my homeschool community by continuing to make 
my vision of space as a normal part of our continued existence a part of our conversations to help bec that become a norm in our conversations and in the sphere I exist in. Are there other things that can be done that are help? So, be because one of the things I see this as is, I talk to people, I talk to my grandma, and my grandma says, "Oh, it's very nice that they send up rockets, but that's a lot of money. Why are we doing that?" Mm -hmm. So, there's got to be a way for me to have these things that I do that help more people begin to see why this, we do that. This was this was a. I was going to set up a session for this to pose a question. Why? Mm -hmm. What? Because this, at least at the government level, this new space kind of gets around this sort of in the sense, in, in, in the best possible way, by having their own reason for why. Mm -hmm. Like, well, they're going to they're going to make money. Make money. Exactly. I have to go up and take satellites. But, but, and but make money. exactly. But but so, so me. That's why I decided not to do it actually, because I decided that really my question is sort of an old-fashioned question. It's trying to justify the space shuttle, trying to justify the space station. Because the question is always, why should we spend money on that? We got all these problems here on the ground, right? And and that's it's it's really hard to sell that argument. I mean, I have this, I, you know, I, I can always say because I love spaceships, but that doesn't you know exactly. help other people who don't exactly. love spaceships. So, right. so um, uh, I was going to ask you, like, where do you live? Like, Downey has has a little cottage industry in being the place that built the space shuttles, right? right? And I was sort of I was trying to ask the guy who, who runs this facility, but. It, kind of moved off the subject, you know, what are they going to do, you know, now that that's no longer, that's going to fade. It's, right. it's going to have a little heat for a little while, but it's going to fade. Um, and like, like when I went to the last couple shuttle launches, you know, the conversation all around Titusville is that place is doomed. I mean, what right. are they going to do? I mean, there's nothing, there's no draw there now. Right. And so, so the flip side of that is what, what communities uh, in California or wherever are going to have a piece of or could have a piece of new space. And maybe that's uh, something you could do, which is you know, sure. go to your local council, city councils, and try to get them interested in trying to get a piece of this. Because that's what sure. kept national support for the, for the Apollo program was that it was spread out. It's a political trick. It is. You know, to put it you know, in all these different Your places. community depends on these for tax dollars. Right. Tax so if you can get them going, you know, here's a revenue stream for the city. To, right. Not, not, a, not, not a tax dollar stream, but a real cash. What are we doing to attract money from the space program? No. The new space program. I mean, like, like you go to like Detroit or someplace like that. That's like that's been you know gutted. Well, now they're having our comeback, but but right. the, those kinds of places are, are maybe opportunities to be generating hardware for new space. Say. Right. Exactly. I live down in San Diego, and so far as I know, um, I am not. Jesse, you might even know, you you would probably know more than I do. Um, not necessarily a an environment in which um, space conventional or new has a, a big voice um, so when somebody says well why do you want you know wh why do you care and my answer has always been that we learn and grow so much from the effort of exploring new places and going and doing new things and you know there's kind of the the very small example of like the development of velcro and all the technological developments that we that come came out of you know just from the earliest days of of developing space travel I mean from the earliest days of developing air travel we we learn all kinds of things it's not about whether or not CNN can broadcast to my house because they got their satellite up it's about the fact that because there's a market for it it drove all kinds of other things and we don't have a lot of we don't have so many venues for really innovative development that we can afford to let this go so that's that's the big argument i made and make when when people kind of get mad at me for being supportive <laughs> because don't you know there are children starving and we should be more focused on problem x y or z um, and so, I, I do. How are we going to feed them? <laughs> right, exactly. It's, 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 you know, the technologies that we develop so that our, you know, the people we send into space can have more efficient heating and cooling and, and food storage means that that's going to trickle down or, you know, whatever technologies we're talking also about. Also, our satellites that, that, that can spot a famine coming, that kind of thing, because mm -hmm. they, can, they can, you know, better earth imaging, that kind of thing. Right. That's, that's going to. Theoretically, somebody help with that. Although, so yeah. So I, I guess uh, what I what I keep hearing over both in here and, and in some other sessions that I've heard of is, 
is mostly it's talking to people and spreading the word, and it's the narrative and the way that you project the, the story. The number one best thing you can do, I've been told by all kinds of people who are not in the space industry, is talk to your senators, talk to your congressmen. So it's, it's amazing how 10 years ago, approximately, I went to one of uh, uh, the National Space Society's, uh, what do they call them, international? ICC. ICC. Yeah. ICC. Went to one of those, and there was a whole bunch of people there who had been to something else that had occurred about two months before that happened. Mm -hmm. and somebody got up and said, okay, well, you know, remember this big thing about call your congressman? And they said, yeah. They said, How many of you actually called your congressman? And something like about a fifth of the people who had been to that other thing held up their hand. So I mean, 80% of space enthusiasts didn't call. Right. You should get a congressman or somebody at one of these events right. just to hear real industry talk about space in a practical way and have them start, you know, kind of get that, holy cow, there's a, there's a, there's a, there's a okay. cash stream in there someplace. Yeah. Right. Getting your congressman to something like this is pretty difficult. I live in an area where my congressman is a space, aerospace enthusiast. And he has to, because of so many call, so much demand on his time, he has to be real stingy with his time on something like this. Now, he's a pro space person, but getting one of his staffers to come is pretty easy. Hmm. So about right. once a about well, once a year, a idea, you know, about once that. a year, our, our AIAA group gets one of his staffers to come out and. It's usually the same one, and she usually just tells us what's happened in Washington over the last year, and it's usually depressing. <laughs> <laughs> but having that contact and, and that conversation and keeping that, that is something that we can do. So that is mm -hmm. just directly, you know, ag address my question. Yeah. So I was thinking of it in a slightly different context, because um, I know you, you, you like food and you like cooking. There are maybe some things that you could do that sort of could, you know, make a contribution to or, or, or maybe highlight some aspect of space that people don't tend to think about. You know, like food preparation on the space station is usually adding hot water to right. a bag and eating a pasty thing that tastes horrible. Mm -hmm. You know, but so, you know, someday we're going to eat real food. Right. And in some contexts, you know, we do like the fresh foods and, and sometimes things made out of tortillas. But, like, but maybe like, you know, maybe maybe something you could sort of do and then use your homeschool connections to sort of like say, you know, what if we, what if this astronauts eat? Or what kind of food would be good for astronauts to eat that, you know, the week the, as school kids, as, as your group? Like, you know, what can you, can you think about? What can you do? Like, you know, how, how, how about a typical lunch, a typical astronaut lunch, and all the kids get to prepare it and right. eat it. Right. Oddly enough, they did do an episode of Top Chef that was, the challenge was to prepare a meal for the space station. Really? It was crazy. Really? It does all around and everything. Yeah. It was fantastic. Wow. Wow. So you, you can't have bread because it's crunch. Right. right. And then that was one of the points they brought up was the texture you miss most is crunch. Ooh. That would be an interesting challenge. Crunch, Find yeah. a way to get that up there. Right. Because, yeah, that's awesome. but mix it in with your stuff. <laughs> You know, I, I saw something on, uh, it was some program about, you know, they were, they were NASA was testing food and, and shelf life, and they were developing these things that could be packaged and stored for uh, up to a decade, which sounds nasty, because you open the thing up and it looks nothing like it was when you put it in there. But I mean, I'm, not, I'm not suggesting that we develop foods that, that have shelf life. I'm thinking no. of like, well, what can we actually make on orbit? I mean, what kinds of things, you can't make soup. Right. Right. Because you know, unless you, well, unless you, you do. can make soup, what's bad about it is that it's just barely warm. Yeah. Yeah. Now why is that? Why is that? Uh, it boils at you know, not much above room temperature. Right, because the pressure, the air pressure is so low. Yeah, the air pressure is so low that it boils at like 110 degrees or something yeah. like that. I don't remember exactly what it is. So maybe you put a pressure cooker. On you, it. Yeah. You can't have hot coffee. Really? Yeah. I mean. Go get a, get a thermometer, stick it in a cup of coffee, wait till it goes down to about 110, or maybe 120 degrees. 
can still, yeah. You know, it's not really hot. And then take a sip. It's just kind of the ultimate yuck range where it's <laughs> not hot and it's not cold. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's just kind of lukewarm. And, okay. Yeah, so, yeah, so um, so then you think about, well, what kind of foods, what kind of soup tastes good at lukewarm, right. you know? Or, 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 or maybe even you think about, well, how do I make hot food? Right. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, 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 you know, maybe you want to develop a, mm -hmm. a cooking. You, you can pressure cook it. Right. And then you've got to squirt it directly out of the pressure cooker into your mouth, which presents a whole lot of problems. One of it's real easy to choke on. And the other is, as it comes out of the pressure cooker, you have a drop in pressure, which leads to a drop in temperature. Yeah. I mean, oh, the, maybe it would decant it into a separate bag first, and then the take the bag are, elsewhere and, and eat out of that. You're, you're saying the minute you lose pressure, you lose temperature at the same right. time? They're the same thing. Down so fast. Really? Yeah. The, the Insulation the, doesn't solve that? You no. You just, it's the uh, pressure. It's the pressure. Yeah. yeah. Oh, as, as you yeah. drop the pressure, it cools the uh, the food. So maybe you superheat it to a point where when the pressure drops, you bring it down to the yeah. temperature. This should be, you were talking about using before mm -hmm. space examples for education, this would be an yeah. outstanding oh, yeah. way to teach something about whatever that is, right. thermodynamics or physics yeah. or something like that. Um, just in, in, the, in the context of food. <laughs> exactly, right. exactly. Right. It's, it's brilliant. Yeah. And it's, and it's, using, it's, and it's, it's easy to do because all you need is a pressure cooker yeah. and you have a thermometer in, in it, and you can say, okay, you know, we've got the pressure in here, and the pressure has got five pounds, which of course put a lot in a pressure cooker, but, you know, most of them run around a pound and a half, three pounds, something like that. But put, say, three pounds in a pressure cooker, and you look at it and say, okay, here, you know, here it is. Drop the pressure, pour it into a, whatever's in there in a bowl or a pan or something like that, and stick a thermometer in it, and you watch the now you can just watch the temperature go. <laughs> wow. Huh. The other thing you could you could think about is you know okay on Earth you have to have a certain amount of calories because you're standing up while you're walking you're you're fighting against gravity uh, in orbits you're not doing that kind of work so what is your calorie requirements there you're not going to necessarily be consuming three thousand calories a day right. you might be and, and and what effect does weightlessness have on appetite uh, yes and, and your taste buds I mean are you, are you do you eat three big meals a day. Or do you just feel like eating one yeah. or, or small? Usually, usually they go to about five meals a day, smaller meals. Small ones, yeah. And the yeah. average is about 1,100 calories You a day. should publish a space cookbook. That would be fun. Here's a, um, so that's, there you go, there's a project for you. There you go. Because <laughs> um, that would require research and you could do your own testing and development. Right. And, you know, you could have space cook-offs at the Emporium. And, what is the important you mentioned that before? No, sorry. It's it's um, the San Diego Space Society operates the Space Travelers Emporium. It's sort of a, an outlet. It's our storefront and our meeting space. And we evangelize space, new space. Where is it? Space. San Diego. Oh, okay. A little far from home. <laughs> I live and work up in New Edwards. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, something and. I wish I'd thought of it beforehand for something like this one, or maybe next year, is you can get astronauts to come and talk. And what you don't want is a ex-military flight astronaut. What you want is a payload specialist, because he will not talk about getting up there right. and, and the orbiter and things like that. Uh, he will talk about living in the orbiter um, Many years ago, yep, I got uh, Dr. Vandenberg True. to uh, come and give a talk. He was a payload specialist, something to do with quartz crystals. I don't remember exactly what it is. That was a very little interest, and in, he covered that in about five minutes in a 45 minute talk. But what he talked about was living in the, the space shuttle and uh, get say half a dozen people in a large bathroom and imagine spending a week like that. Right. So that's about what it's like. Yeah. Um, it's like, it tastes like. Uh, and you know, he talked about things like the trip he made was a trip where they took the monkeys up and they had the uh, monkey cage come apart in, oh. in flight. Oh. He says, well, one of the things was that 
in the earlier part of the flight, so you, you've seen probably seen the, the, the film clips of them tossing M and M's around and yeah. you know, grabbing M and M's with their mouth in midair. Or he says the thing is, you know, you do this, and after a while, there's M and M's floating all over the place, and you're going along, and that, you know, you grab one and pop top in your <laughs> mouth. Well, uh, monkey poo and M and M's look. <laughs> Fairly similar, <laughs> and he says more than once somebody. <laughs> he, he refused to say though whether he had gotten one or not. Oh, <laughs> so that's that's just oh, the idea. oh my gosh! But he said that it was, it was just, they managed to get the monkeys back in the cage. The monkeys actually wanted back in the cage. <laughs> he says that was not a a a bad part. He says uh, this is. The monkeys ran around for five, ten minutes, and he says they were. So once they stopped chasing, the monkeys went back to their cages because they felt secure in the cage. Right. He says, that, he says, but he says they were still cleaning up the day they deorbited. <laughs> wow. wow. He, says, he says you'd go to sleep, and he talks about you know sleeping. You get in this little lightweight sleeping bag, and you have this you know floating in water face down that your muscles normally right. naturally oh, tend you to, yeah. and. Uh, and he talks about, you, you know, you sit in the, you get in the sleeping bag and it hangs on the wall and you're just sitting there, you know, sleeping like that. But he says that first night in space like that was, he did not sleep very well, but from then on he says, well, some of the best nights sleep he had. Um, and he talks about, you know, he talked about the food and that one of the things is that the cookers they had uh, so they have hot plates. So this hot plate gets because of the, act, the danger of somebody putting a hand or bumping up against it or something like that. It's only hot enough that if you put your hand on it, it says it's going to be hot, but it's not going to burn you rapidly. It says you wouldn't want to keep your hand on it for more than a couple of seconds. It says, but that's as hot it is. So he says, so that's as hot as your food gets. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, it says. He said that uh, it got so that he practically lived on oatmeal when in orbit because he says that was the only thing that cooked up well and he liked. <laughs> Tasted good. Uh, he actually brought along some stuff that was in a little plastic bag and it was white and not, it was just kind of mushy and uh, but solid. And he cut it up into about half inch cubes and everybody got a taste of one and it was kind of like concentrated blah. <laughs> I mean, there was just no taste to it. Right. And uh, he said that, uh, he said, uh, I can't remember what it was, some kind of a, like a pastry. Mm. And he says to, in order to get pastry to taste good in space for some reason, you just have to load it with grease and sugar. <laughs> Well, see, that's, that's another thing where I think it's interesting. You, then this may actually give you opportunities to fly things on, you know, on, uh, on nano racks. Mm. So you could, do, you, could do, uh, food, you could do food and or uh, um, uh, equipment sort of testing in the sense that you could maybe, like, you know, how does sugar crystallize in space or, you know, does honey or, I don't know, just what well, I'm just thinking of. There is, NASA has a... Uh, one of their websites they have a thing for they actually ask for people to suggest stuff for cooking and you can uh, get them to try it and I know that they've had people come in yeah. and cook stuff and send it up into well, the idea I, the idea I'm thinking of is though is not so much because I know I know I know Karen mm -hmm. and I know that she likes whole foods and and real foods so the idea wouldn't be you know pre-cooking and packaging processed foods on the ground and then shipping it out packages so they could just consume it. But actually having things they make on orbit where they, mm -hmm. where they uh, So what kind of foods are going to respond well and what kind right. of foods are not going to respond well to actually being up there in the first place? And what kinds of things can they grow up there like hydroponically right. or something right. like that? Right. You know, fresh produce for your fresh whole foods. Because you know, the, everyone's story is that when, they, when the shipment that they send out the first thing they unload is the fresh is produce the fresh and the fresh fruits, and then that's what gets consumed first. You know, so what kind of thing would be it would be nice to have on a continual basis on orbit that they? You know, NASA's been developing hydroponics. That right. Fly and as we start talking about moon bases and really long-term duration kinds of things, then you're going to want to go on Mars yeah. or whatever. Like you're going to have a hydroponics yeah. 
section of people that are farmers growing food and then and that's gonna help with the oxygen production. But but knowing uh, you know, mm -hmm. is it is it is lettuce gonna be a good thing to grow or right. out there? Or is it you know, romaine versus iceberg versus, you know, spinach or something like that? Right. Long, long time ago, early in the shuttle program, I put in a, a proposal that basically what I wanted was something about a foot thick in the diameter of the, of the shuttle bay mm -hmm. and uh, was going to put a whole bunch of different things you could grow mm -hmm. in there and wanted to use the outer rim to simulate Mars gravity and then halfway in you would mm -hmm. have a another row of stuff that would be pretty close to lunar gravity. Mm. And uh, they said, great idea. It'll cost you three millions, something like this. Right. And I thought, oh, okay, I'll just pop down to the bank, get out the three million dollars. Right. <laughs> right. And I, you know, I started talking about, I wrote back and forth to them a couple times about funding. And they said just basically that if you want to do something like this, you got to fund it yourself. Yeah. And. Uh, like no, we're not interested in things that do it in space. Like, no. yeah, well, see, <laughs> what we're assume. looking for is that somebody else had done a a thing about plants growing, and one of the things that they had grown was uh, they grew corn, and I can't remember what else it was in microgravity. And just basically, what happened is the everything that they tried to grow all suffered from the same thing. The roots didn't know where to go, which direction to go, so they went all in directions. And the stalks didn't know which directions to go, so they went all directions. They had something that I don't remember what it was, but the stalks came out, kind of turned like this, and went down, and the roots came out and went up down like this, and it went yeah. like, <laughs> you know, kind of like that. <laughs> and, uh, but it, other than the fact that it reacted to the lack of gravity. As far as they could tell, there was no, nothing else going on. But one of the problems they had is that in order to load this stuff, they have to load it a couple of days before they launch. So you've got several days where you've got the thing started in Earth gravity. Right. You know, then you launch it up and it spends some time in microgravity. Mm -hmm. And then you bring it back down to Earth, and it's a week or so before they get to the point where they've unloaded everything, and yeah, here's your experiment. And they're looking for something that's in a foot cube box. All right, right. I think that's going to be great. Right now, the, the big thing is these four inch cube boxes. Right. And uh, the, they had done this, and I thought, okay, we're not going to grow much in microgravity anyway, so you know, what about the moon? What about Mars? And that's when I wrote them this proposal. And uh, just basically what they said is, yeah, we, you know, we'd be interested, but you got to pay for it. <laughs> yeah, sends your results. Yeah. But I think there's an opportunity where you, there's a lot of things you could do here. Right. And even like, you know, like, hey, I've developed this new blah, blah. I'm going to send up, uh, I want astronauts to test it out on the space station. Right. And I think that this um, addresses kind of what I've, I've been thinking about, which is, how can I do things that assume people are living in space or people are traveling and working right. in space? Mm -hmm. How can I do things that assume this and find a way to share that with other people so that they can also assume, you know, they can share that assumption. Um, and then, you know, it, the, the bonus, of course, would be if it could actually benefit people who are doing things in space right mm -hmm. now um, or benefit them in some future way, um, even if they wouldn't be able to use it now. But but again, the, the teachable moments, right? The both in, in the terms of teaching people about space and also teaching them other things and using space as the example. Besides, how cool would it be? So you publish this this uh, space cookbook, right? Mm -hmm. And a bunch of people now read it, and maybe it helps evangelize the thing, whatever. Right. Twenty years from now, there's a base in the moon, and. The, the basic the chef <laughs> just has to have that book because it was the first ever written right. space book. So it's there on the shelf on the moon because you wrote it. How that cool is that? That would be very cool. That would be very cool. I, I was thinking even suborbital stuff. You could do yeah. stuff on suborbital things. Yeah. Just to figure out on a, on a shorter, less costly. Yeah. I think there's I mean, a, a, interesting opportunities there. Yeah. Both. 
in plant growth and, and food production. Right, and certainly, you know, if you can grow plants successfully in space, that might lower costs for Bigelow, for mm -hmm. example. <laughs> but it, it's the cooking. It's but it the, is the cooking. It's it, the, the, the using whole materials. Because we are people yeah. living in space, and we can't ignore six million years of evolution just you know, because we have developed. We jumped off. Well, look at the other side of the coin. You can't afford to ship stuff from here to there. Right. Just so yeah. you can eat. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And it, it, there's a kind of a limited utility to assuming that you can always ship things from Earth too. I mean, if if we're going to think big, we're going to think big, and we're going to think about colonization and long-term travel. And and that's why I meant you mentioned you know being able to grow things as well, um, just because. Knowing that you can do that means that you can plan on living long term in other spaces. So, so one of the one of the you know the space society did uh, science fair judging in our, in our first year, and one of the, the high one of the top award winners was this ninth grader who developed this. It was basically a centrifuge growing carrots in inside in of the a, in the washer in the, the washing machine, machine right? Yeah. So he he grown carrots in, for, in the, with this thing spinning for thirty days. And it was partly to see, you know, what kind of effect that a, that a microgravity or a, a direct a change in the gravity would have on it. But you could have that kind of a thing if you wanted gravity to orient your your vegetable growth. You could have like a mini drum that, that spins, and you have things growing on the outer part of it, and, and you know, around a central column of light. Right. You know, I mean, maybe it's, that's just an idea. To, to, it is. It is. Can you produce that? Now. Yeah. You know, some farmer in Kansas, the guy is just a farmer, mm -hmm. wrote a book about what he thought various crops would do if grown on the moon. And he says, well, the problem is, and this is all theory, is until we actually go grow something on the moon, because we don't know. Right. Just, right. Well, we know things can grow almost anywhere. I mean, it, unless you're talking about poles. And even, even the Arctic has grass, you know, part of the year. So we know that you've got a wide range of plant life that can survive in a lot of different places. I was thinking about the gravity thing with the roots that come up. And the, you, know, you want to focus on plants that tend to, to a bushiness anyway, right? <laughs> so, well, right? One of the things he thought of is that wheat would probably grow to be four or five feet tall. <laughs> so you'd still get you know six inches of uh, a grain at the top of right. it, but you'd waste all of this extra energy growing the stock that was yeah. right. two and a half times normal. Right. right, but then what you're talking about then is you need um, all kinds of um, uh, augmentation to your soil too, you know, because yep. you were talking about soil, you know, if you're, you're probably talking about an in, you know, a dedicated growing space that isn't just using sol uh, lunar soil because it's yeah. so well, stripped by radiation you know, and so on. Um, the, the rocks they brought back and stuff, they had some powder, and they put enough powder, enough lunar material together so they could plant a pea in it and tried to grow this pea. And it actually grew. They just did not have enough of it. The pea just basically Sprouted. died of starvation yeah. when it was about, the plant, when it was about, I think it was about eight inches tall or something right. like that. But uh, they just simply didn't have enough lunar soil to let it live its full lifespan. But they say that it's but it, did sprout. it sprouted. It seemed in all ways, you know, it, it got dissected by teams of botanists. And they said, as far as they could tell, it just grew in a normal manner. That, uh, That's problem. Hello. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> just figured we'd come see what this morphed into. Yeah, just a few of us talking about. Um, the idea that if we are not people who are building rockets, how can what can we do like in our normal lives to be encouraging um, both a, an understanding of what and why we you know what is uh, um, space exploration, space development? Why do we want it? You know why do we care? And what can I do when I leave here? What kind of things can I do that is something that is helping in some way my idea of people considering space a valuable resource and part of our our next step. So I think after we leave here, what can we do is kind of your job. So <laughs> <laughs> Incidentally, did you see the uh, 
the ISS Notify project by, um, he goes by Natronics on Twitter. For like yes, now. we're going to be carrying it. Oh, awesome, because I didn't contribute enough to buy one because I was broke at the time, <laughs> and I really want one. Yes. So I, they're, they're beautiful. He, he did this just as a, a, a guy on Twitter. I, for the life of me, I cannot think of his name. I, just, I only know his Twitter handle. Chris would know, but I... Yeah, and he was at yeah. Space of San Diego, and I can't, for the life of I think he was. Was he? I don't remember. I have been along either. Anyhow, it's, he, he just started out by putting this together as a fun little, hey, see what I did video. And it's just this little black box that pop, plugs into his computer and has a panel about yay big, translucent. It's got a, sketching, a sketch of the ISS on it. And it's plugged into his computer and he's running Heavens Above or something that tells him when the ISS is going over. And when it goes over, the lamp lights up. And so every 90 minutes, Mm. There's a story, but I thought I would love to see that in every classroom. Just as a, you wouldn't even have to talk about it all much, just every 90 minutes you'd notice this going overhead and you'd, you'd think, oh, six people just flew <laughs> over my head. <laughs> and it's, it's brilliant and it's so simple. And I thought I would love to see more things like that so that people just get used to thinking there's people up there. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. There's people up there. That is a great thing to kind of catch on. Yeah, yeah well, and that's what I do because I. Uh, in the, the place I used to live, I haven't got my telescope set up to this house, but you know, I'd go out and watch every ISS pass I could. Just step out into the street, set up my tripod, set up my camera, go out and watch. And I frequently had neighbors, neighborhood kids come over and say, what are you looking at? I'd say, oh, you know, hang out three more minutes and I'll show you. And they'd come, see that? That's the size of a football field and there's six, six people on it right now. And they, you know, you just see them suddenly realize, wait, there's people in the space right now. Yeah. And it was great to see, and you know they, and then any time after that, they saw me say, "Oh, I saw this thing about space," or "When's the next pass?" or things like this. So, mm -hmm. and that's actually what I love about the ISS being that visible is it's much easier to. And in that one, you know, since it's not a shuttle mission that lasts a couple of weeks, it's oh, there's people actually living there, which is nice. Yeah, I'm really happy that you're, carrying, that you're carrying those lamps because I really want one. Yeah, we, we, we will definitely be carrying those. So, so, when they so this store of yours, is it, it's online, I assume? We do have an online presence. There's, there's so it's a Space like Travelers it. Emporium. Space Travelers. Yeah. That, but the ISS Notify isn't available yet. Yeah. He's, right now he's satisfying the Kickstarter. Right, yeah, I funded this through Kickstarter. Oh, yeah, so no, I had to but once, yeah, once that run is done, then it then will actually be produced and, and nice. we'll be carried. I'm so excited about that. Of course, the cool thing and the encouraging thing with that was what happened when he put up his video on Twitter, then people just started running with it, like Bad Astronomer retweeted it, and a bunch of people did, and got a lot of publicity. And so then he put it up on Kickstarter as, maybe people would fund this, maybe people are interested, and he wanted to get $6,000 in a month, and he got 18000 in three weeks. Yeah. Because <laughs> it just, people were really interested, so that was really encouraging. So that's pretty much all I have to say. It's all. Yeah. <laughs> you guys almost went through the whole hour. Oh my gosh, really? Uh, no, I didn't. Oh my gosh. <laughs> About 20 minutes down in east on Imperial. Yeah, there are no oh, 2.30 oh, talks. There were no 2 o'clocks or 2.30 talks. So. Yeah, 2.30 was just getting break. Yeah, well. Well, I'm really interested in you being an author. It's also just the non-profit yeah, space. I like that space. Yeah. That space yeah. that I guess. There was a two in here on yeah. Yeah. tourism. I know where you come from. There was a two o'clock in here on right. space tourism. Was yeah. it? Not anymore. <laughs> the panel's blank. Oh, really? I think so many people went on the tour. Yeah, yeah. 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 nobody wants yeah. to do yeah. their yeah. talk yeah. when there's yeah. nobody here. There's still a bunch of people in Dave Matheson's thing, but... Right. What are you talking about? Uh, commercial space architecture, like what are the what are the rules need to be? What are the you know structure needs to be? What kind of support does there need to be? Um, he's mostly focusing on lunar um, landers, not manned. Maybe manned later. So. And what do you do? Somebody said your job is. <laughs> so what does that mean? Yeah, well, I'm the press manager for the Space Frontier Foundation. Oh, really? And then I help. I help other space groups, space nonprofits, popularize what they're doing and it's, it's, give them it's a suggestions on how to spread the word and stuff. Not only learn about Especially ones that are run by engineers who are <laughs> not less than good at communicating. Right. Yes. Like, look, this acronym, I will talk about it. Well, it's more the, uh, we built something so perfect and so engineeringly 
like brilliant that they will come. So, yeah. We built it <laughs> sitting in the desert. They will come. Yeah, it's kind of like an no, they won't. <laughs> they won't. <laughs> Only if they know about it. <laughs> yes. That's the problem. What's your first name? Mary Michael. They're doing it from a non-cover. Yeah. Easier to look. It's phonetic. Right. Does anybody know... Uh, I always understood that one of the reasons we launched most of our heavy stuff from Florida had to do with orbital, had to do with, had to do with being on the equator. Yeah, equatorial it, versus polar orbit. Right. Well, and, but also sort of having more sort of throw because we're on, yeah, we're on the equator. The Earth right? is spinning that direction, so you're already gaining almost a thousand miles an hour. Yeah, you're you're at your fastest speed, sort of, on the equator, right? <laughs> yeah. is, that, is, that, is that true? Yeah, and on the equator, you're just a little bit over a thousand miles an hour. Uh, up in Florida, you're. Uh, I think it's 890, something like that. Uh, as you go farther north, the, the, the speed drops off real fast till you're down to zero at, at the poles. But uh, if I remember correctly, you've got about 890 miles an hour added to your launch speed just from the speed of the Earth. Right. So that that's especially important either to orbit or to get out of orbit. If you're going suborbital, it doesn't really make any difference. Right. right? So where are we when you launch out of like out of the desert up here? If, if people launch out of out of okay, if they're going launching out of the desert, they're going up and back down again, and pretty much don't care. Okay. If you launch out of Vandenberg, you launch south because if you launch north, you go over uh, San Francisco, and the people up there don't get real excited if you do that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, if you launch, so they all launch south for polar orbits. Uh, if you were to launch west, you built in a negative 900 miles an hour. You've got to overcome right from the word mm. go. So that, so that doesn't make any sense. Would do that. However, um, if you've got a a horizontal takeoff like uh, a space plane they tried to develop a while ago. Uh, you have ways of overcoming the directional uh, because basically what you do is you get up and you let the earth move underneath you mm -hmm. <laughs> rather than trying to run across the earth. But uh, if, if you've got something that will make or orbit, you know, using wings and hor you know, hor horizontal takeoff wings until you get up to speed and altitude, in which case you then kick in your rocket engine and go the last, I'll say the last half, even though it's 90% of the distance, energy-wise, it's the last half. Uh, that way, it, doesn't, it really doesn't matter which direction you're going. One of the reasons I was asking is that New Space seems to be based in California, kind of, or at least maybe it's just, it seems that way because I live here, but, but is that not true? Yeah. Is the new space well, movement not It really depends important? on what you look at as new space. If you're looking at the real baby companies, the SpaceX, the Mastin, the X Corps, then yeah, they do seem to have a trying to make California the new space coast. But you know, when you talk about new space, you also have to kind of include Boeing and uh, SS Laurel and the other guys that are commercial yeah. space companies that are trying their best to ad adapt to this, and they're all over the place. Yeah. I think once you know these companies get to the point where they actually have to launch. You know, SpaceX launches out of Florida. Back to Florida, right? They're all, they're gonna launch heavy, I guess, out of Vandenberg. Oh, at least first to launch, start. and then they're moving it to. Then they'll yeah. move. So, yeah. one I think of the, they just like another, building here. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> another advantage of right. launching out of Florida is that you don't have anybody in front of you, uh, and you have this string of the Caribbean islands going down there that you put a radar station down every couple hundred miles, and you can watch what what you're doing. So. Hmm. But it has the advantage of you're launching east, so you get gain from from the spin of the Earth, and there's nobody out there till you come to Africa. Right. Mm -hmm. Same out of Vandenberg. I mean, you have polar orbits here, and there's nothing above you. Yeah, uh, there's you know south of Vandenberg, there's nothing there. What is east of Mojave? <laughs> East of Mojave? Las Vegas. Mojave. Barstow. Right. I don't care. Yeah, in Barstow, Vegas, I think people have missed. Barstow, I don't know. 
I grew up there. You miss anything? would be considered uh, urban improvement. <laughs> Um, but, you know, I like White Sands, They're, the people in uh, New Mexico are trying very hard to make that a space center. And they've got somebody who's based there, I don't remember who, but uh, once again it's going to depend a whole lot on what kind of reliability they can demonstrate. And when you stop and think about it, New York City Every few seconds, they take an airplane off over the city, mm -hmm. and nobody thinks a thing about it. Mm -hmm. And we've seen one of these days, days disaster. Yeah, you know, one of these days, somebody's going to draw one of your large jetliners into Manhattan or someplace and wipe out a couple thousand people, and and, uh, and everybody say, maybe this isn't such a good idea. Oh, well, it only happened once in a century. Okay, do it. Keep going. <laughs> So how do they manage that? You know, you've got all these different organizations, different air, co you know, countries that are able to negotiate the international airspace and people flying all over the place. Uh, the routes. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, just you know, as we as we start sending more and more people and just stuff into orbit. Oh. Um, we had a panel on that new space about how the FAA is trying to step in and. Yeah, and manage the, Euro that, the but Europeans have set up a uh, a commission on that, and of course the very first thing is they want A and NASA wants B, and they're nowhere near each other. So uh, instead of them saying, oh, "Well, where can we meet in the middle age?" say, "No, we're going to do it our way." <laughs> yeah, plus there's like an argument, at least in the United States, for the launches that you know the FAA comes in and says, "Hey, we're the best at doing this. This is what we do. We manage airplanes. Yeah. We can manage airplanes higher." Uh, but then NASA and some of the government agencies are like, no, no, we want to keep it because we need more jobs. We're laying off enough people. We don't want to let the FAA take these jobs. So there's like a bit of a, a fight going on about it. But hey, can I eventually. ask you, why, why does nobody here, and I'm, maybe I'm about to say a, a dirty word because I've heard no one ever mention this term here. Why does no one talk about Virgin Galactic here ever? Because I think... Most of these people I mean, New are Space, I don't see that. They don't seem to sponsor anything. You know, what, what is that? They're, they're, they have to have the biggest bankroll of anybody, right? Don't they have a gigantic bankroll? Well, I think <laughs> one, one side of it is the fact that they've gotten to the size where they don't participate in stuff like this, so we don't have a lot of people. Even at New Space, which is much bigger, we don't have that many Virgin Galactic representatives. Um, the other thing is that... Well, Will Tom Guns was here yesterday. Yeah, Will was here. But he didn't do like you know no. panel or anything. No. I think the other thing is that they're they're so narrowly focused. You know, right now they're just space tourism, suborbital. They've got this craft, and so everybody's right, right. it's kind it's of become quite, old news to not, people. Right, right. We're Nothing we're not, has changed. Yeah, it's not quite commercial space or new space because it doesn't. I mean, yeah, it's space tourism. It's more a thrill ride. <laughs> yeah, kind of at the moment. They're, they're I mean, they're they're, they're, they're looking, they're looking to go beyond that, but it's still. But their there's plans there's to go beyond that is very, they don't share a lot of their plans. Yeah. Yeah. The Bert, Bert Rutan, who you know, started it and, and uh, Branson bankrolled it, he's a very keep it close to this undercover type person. It's just his natural personality. I mean, he lives 20 miles from me, and every now and then I run into him. And uh, you know, if, if you run into him in a story, you never. Think this is a guy, you know, <laughs> leading us into space or anything like that. He's. Uh, I mean, you have to think about yeah, it. Like times, next yeah, yeah, or times he looks like his next next stop is going to be uh, some place where he can buy some halfway decent used clothes. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yeah, I think if we had had space up around the time that the X Prize first, the Ansari X Prize was launched, then we would all be talking about Virgin Galactic. But now. The big thing is, oh, it's all about SpaceX and all about X Core and stuff. So right. I think it's just the timing of it and the fact that what they're doing, we all know what they're doing, that it's not that much news. You do hit on a good point, though, because I, I find when I'm telling people about the, these sort of events that aren't in this space, they, um, they're like, oh, yeah, like Virgin Galactic. You know, like that's right. the first thing yeah. out of their mouth is Virgin Galactic. Right. Well, it's right. because they know the brand. Yeah. Virgin. I mean, everyone knows Virgin this and that. They've done great publicity yeah. for it, too. Yeah. And if you think about it, if, like, if if the government industry hears, hears about it here 
and then us fan fanboys hear about it here, and then the general public hears about it another you know a year or two later. So the general public is just hearing about yeah. the Virgin Galactic excitement. We're all like, oh, that's old news to us because <laughs> we're all on top of it. Well, and, you know, Branson is really good at making things adventurous and fun and crazy and extreme. He's not, he's not your usual, you know, suit sitting there talking in acronyms. I know, which is why you know he gets some of that explorer spirit that really people want to connect with. They just most people aren't. One thing they've stopped associating that with space, which is unfortunate, uh -huh. and they just don't see it anywhere. But they can see it in him. Yeah, and he's, he's, kind he's of like really an good at projecting that persona. Yeah, he kind of makes Elon Musk look like staid and calm in a <laughs> suit and stuff, and you're like, it's, it's Elon Musk. It's crazy. <laughs> Yeah, I'd like to know more about what Virgin's doing now, but, I mean, we had a keynote speech from um, George, George Whiteside's uh, the thing, and even that was kind of like, Black you know. <laughs> yeah, I mean, they, people asked, they were like, so, you know, what are your orbital plans? Are you going to you gonna dock with Boeing? And he's like, we have plans. Yeah. <laughs> and I was like, what are they? <laughs> we have this is like the apple of uh, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah. It's behind the frosted glass. Yeah, the doors right. are locked. In fact, that spaceship campus they're building up in Cupertino, mm -hmm. that's being built by Ver by Ver I'm just making. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I think that's definitely something that people who aren't rocketeers can do is pressure more of these companies to share more information, to mm -hmm. act interested, to contact them repeatedly, so they kind of go, oh. Okay, maybe people really do want to hear about this and be well, like, hey, you know. And, you a, and a lot of it is once you get to a certain point in yeah, business, you don't right. want to talk about it because yeah, that's kind of way, way, yeah. way to do yeah. Well, also, if you're, if you're a virgin and you're wanting, you're building yourself a space tourism and you're wanting to make it somewhat popular level, you don't want to give away, I, I'm guessing you wouldn't want to give away a lot of plans and then have it either not work for some reason because yeah. you're trying to make yourself sound really reliable yeah. so that people are not afraid to fly with you. I'm guessing that's that factors in. Yeah, they definitely can't take as much risk. some setbacks. You know, there's things around, uh, oh, crack in the wing. Gee, don't tell anybody know about this. Yeah. But also the idea that, you know, if you're Apple, you're not going to tell them, no, in the next 10 years we're going to come out with, you know, the iPad and the iPhone and the uh, You want to have your surprise taken care of, it works, and then you let everybody yeah. know about it. Yeah. And then you let them buy stuff, and then you let them know about something else. And then you let them buy stuff. So Yeah, the NASA concept of following it from inception to completion and seeing all the research steps, that's not gonna happen in commercial space because it just no. doesn't make sense for their company. So it's not as good for fans, but Right. <laughs> I think there's enough information out there that, I mean, 99% of it isn't being spread out there anyway, so we still have plenty to <laughs> push out without, with, even if they are cagey and secretive. Right. Right. So I guess that's another way. It's just focusing on spreading the news that is there mm -hmm. in whatever way you can. And that's a big project. In a way, the scarcity of information is a good thing, because I'm from the movie business, and when I was a kid, it was really cool to find out about how things were made. Every now and then, you'd, you know, on TV, they'd have a making of or something like that, and that was a cool thing. Now it is so overexposed. It's on every DVD. Yeah, I mean, I'm I work in the field, and I'm sick of it, and, and I'm just like, and it's just like, there's just not. I have a good friend of mine who's an entertainment journalist, and it's just hell. I mean, he comes out with exclusive, what he thought were exclusive interviews, and it's hard to get people, 20 minutes later or faster, before he's even published, there's, it's everywhere, there's so many bloody websites and everything, and so it's, it's just, in a way it's good that this is less exposed, so that you can kind of, kind of, you can kind of, there's more curiosity about it, more, more. And when they make an announcement, it's something It's news, it's something it's worth Yeah, exactly. Yeah. But I suppose there's a, an interesting happy medium to be reached where you, you kind of need to have people know enough that there's actually stuff going on so that there are people who are interested when the announcements are made. Yeah. Right. You know? And yeah, just right. take it as some little crackpot. Right. Anybody right. doing a stunt. Do I need to care about that? You know? No, you're right. You, you, you have to get to a certain threshold of interest. 
Right. I do remember that the, uh, the Dayton, Ohio Express, the newspaper there in town, carried the news of the Wright brothers' first flight four days after it happened. And it was a daily newspaper. But it just wasn't worth reporting until they had some empty <laughs> space. Really? <laughs> wow. That's funny. Wow. Just on the moon. That was uh, a week ago. Okay. <laughs> and the, uh, the editor of the paper was interviewed 20 years later, something like that. You can remember it was right, there was the war, World War I in Europe had already started. We weren't involved in it when this guy was interviewed. And he was asked about why they didn't report the uh, the Wright Brothers' first flight, and he says, it wasn't important. So is it that time? Who cared? Yeah, if you guys have time, go on to Space Vacast and look at Mark Sarangelo's um, keynote from New Space, because he gave this awesome history lesson on um, on the beginning of the flight era and Wright Brothers working with the government to make their first you know, commercial planes and the first governmental planes. and. His point was that, you know, new space is going to have failures. We're going to have deaths. We can't let that stop us. Like, when we had a death in NASA, it was like, everybody stop. We've got to do a 10-year study as to what we want. And we can't do that because in the Wright Brothers, they said one of their first test flights, he goes up with a government um, official who's supposed to be, you know, viewing the riding in the vehicle, and they crash, and he dies. The government guy dies. And the right brother doesn't, and he gets out, and on his own, he researches it, figures out what went wrong, tells the uh, other officials, like, here's what went wrong, here's how I'm going to fix it. And they're like, all right, fix it, give us another plane, we'll, we'll go up in it again. And it's like, uh -huh. you think about government right now going, <laughs> you killed one of our own, and we're just going to climb back in your cockpit? <laughs> right, well, that's the problem. You know, regulation will clamp in the minute mm -hmm. that happens. I mean, so so they were, the point of him saying the story was to try to remind any of the government officials that are there that there is another way to do that. You don't have to clamp down. And there are people willing to risk their lives and mm -hmm. sign a little waiver saying, it's fine, if I die, don't stop the program. I can't remember what it is, but somebody advertised for people to do something that was extremely dangerous. Was it Shackleton's advertisement, I think? I yes. Yes, yes. he had that amazing one. one. Yes. About two, three years ago. Oh. Anyway, no, he had. Okay. Anyway, uh, he was hoping to get a couple dozen applicants. He got almost a hundred thousand. Most of these guys were people who did things like bungee jumping. Uh, this is something to do with an island somewhere, didn't it? I remember hearing about this. My brother actually, I think, applied for this bloody thing. I can't remember what it was, but I remember this. I don't remember. Was that the one where they had one? They were going to send one person to go live on, a, like, go live and take care of an island by themselves. Yeah, that doesn't sound super dangerous, but that, no, that maybe is the one I'm thinking of. Mm, yeah, I mean, it was dangerous. You're by yourself on an island in the middle of nowhere. Yeah, it's definitely not like extreme sport. Right. This was to do. I, I don't remember what the heck this was. Uh, I'm you know, racking my brain trying to, trying to remember what it was, but he was just, he was l looking for a couple of dozen people that he could select one out of, and he got so many applicants that it was impossible to sort through them. And it was guys who were all into extreme sports. They had some woman who had spent, she wrote from a hospital bed where she had got smashed up in the experimental airplane she had built and was trying to do something that everybody had advised her not to do. I always thought that was another good market for uh, space was the extreme sport guys. Yeah. Mm -hmm. They're really into that kind oh, of yeah. stuff. Especially doing the, the suborbital skydiving. Yeah, right? skydiving. Yeah. You know, if, you, if, if we were talking 200 years ago, those are the guys who would have gone out on the, on the wagon trains. Those are the ones who would have gone out for the gold rush. They're the ones mm -hmm. who would have said, I don't have a lot of resources, but I've got my energy, I've got my stamina, I've got my drive, and I'm going to go do something that's going to sound crazy, but it's going to be great. And we don't have a lot of venues for that, unless you've got a lot of education behind you so that you have numbers and letters and, you know, yeah. Or a lot of money and you can right. go buy that experience. Basically. Exactly, yeah. exactly. But the opportunities for those experiences are very rare, and 
and um, there are so many liabilities. So many other the government is taking care of you. We don't want you getting hurt. <laughs> yeah. And so kids go out and go skateboarding in places where they're defying gravity and cement at the bottom. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, I have a grandson who is really into skateboarding and he's. Uh, was what, we were watching some world extreme sport thing this last weekend, and uh, um, these guys were getting like 10 feet up over the lip and then dropping back down. And, you know, now and then somebody would miss, and they'd wind up at the bottom of the thing. Yes, you're sliding down a curving slope, but they're sliding for 30 feet. And these guys are uh, not always coming out of it <laughs> uninjured. <laughs> And they go in there just basically you know, armored up fairly well so that they don't get hurt. Yeah. You know? and, all, and all of them make the statement that, yeah, sometimes when I'm out just playing, I don't put on the, the body, you know, the helmet and the elbow pads. And on the other hand, they had one of the guys who was like, this took second. You know, he said, I always figured if you cut, if you got elbow pads and you go out there and you get hurt and your elbow pads are sitting 10 feet away, that's pretty stupid. <laughs> <laughs> Furthermore, how often do they interview the person who does that, came down on his head, his head skull got cracked open, now he has brain damage? Yeah. In other words, you never do. The interview is self select for the right. people who have not yet been hurt because right. they're still out there. That's who you're going to interview. Right. It's <laughs> a good example in the football industry right now, how they're yeah. just now coming out with the, oh, all these guys are brain damaged. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Yeah. Surprise, surprise. I guess the next talk starts in about 15 minutes. Yeah. yeah. I mean, chance to do something somewhere. Oh, <laughs>